So I'm going to build an actual 10 base 2 network. But before doing that, I need some tooling. So what about building a TCP IP DOS boot floppy to serve as a diagnostics aid during my network setup? Let's talk about legacy network technology. I'm the vintage collector and these are my stories. The question is, which DOS release to take as a basis? I'm somewhat inclined to use DOS 6, so either PC-DOS 6 or MS-DOS 6, as I want to use the config.sys boot menu capabilities. And basically I make my choice simply by looking at the combined sum of these startup files, being it ibmbio.com and ibmdos.com and io.sys and msdos.sys plus the obligatory command.com. And even so the difference is only small as IBM DOS 6.1 allocates 127.5 kilobytes, MS DOS 6.22 accounts for a few bytes more at 128.5 kilobytes. Alright, I'm just making fun and jokes here. In the end I just chose PC DOS as I used MS DOS in my previous videos. The only reason I looked at the sum of the system files was because I intend to also create the 360k5 one quarter inch floppy disk sets, hence I need to know the exact disk space requirement. I'll come back to that aspect in a moment, meanwhile I'm installing PCDOS 6.1 onto my virtual machine as I'll use that as my building base. So you may be wondering what will be included in my network boot floppies. So I started by assembling a batch file to help me creating such a boot disk in a reproducible way. To begin with, I included the network drivers. Now, it's worth mentioning that different driver implementations existed for DOS. There's ODI, the Open Data Link interface, which was coming from Apple and Novell. Microsoft and 3Com favored NDIS, the Network Driver Interface specification. And besides that, there was also PC TCP packet drivers. Needless to say, they all were incompatible and, to no surprise, not all network cards came with all three driver types by default. Luckily, you could install so-called shims to provide a compatibility layer. So if your application demanded a packet driver interface but you only had an ODI driver at hand, a shim could sit in between to translate. I won't be looking into this today, as for now I'll only include the packet drivers for some of the network cards I have around, most notably some Realtek and 3Com ones, PCNet and of course any 2000 compatibles. For some network cards I also include the configuration utilities, although we won't be seeing those in use today. As I'm developing this in 86 box, I just configured an NE2000 compatible network card with RQ10 and IO address 300 hex. We'll see that again in a more hands on episode when I'm building up the actual network. But proper, and that means conflict free resource assignment was key back in the days. The original IBM PC architecture defined a well known set of interrupt request lines, 8 in total. These were intended to provide a direct communications channel between peripherals and the CPU to ask for its attention. Whenever the CPU would receive an interrupt request by, let's say, the keyboard controller, it would temporarily stop whatever it was doing and process the data coming from the device requesting data processing. It was soon obvious that the original 8 interrupt lines being too scarce, so another 8 were added in subsequent revisions of the PC design. And although it foresaw some free IRQs available for add-in peripherals, it remained at a total of 16 forever, causing quite some headache for PC owners for years to come. Because, for one, you had to configure your add-in card, the network card in our example, to use a free IRQ. Sounds easy, but once you added more peripherals, be it SCSI controllers, sound cards and whatnot, it soon became a challenge to find a free IRQ. 
and there was no interrupt sharing, so allocating an IRQ to more than one card at a time, or even reusing one of those already used by system components, would lead to weird problems. From the PC not booting at all, it working sometimes, sometimes not, in short, it was a disaster. More recent technology like the PCI bus, which came in 1992, explicitly allowed for interrupt sharing to overcome that limitation. And present day technology like PCIe doesn't rely on direct interrupt lines any longer, so this is in fact a problem of days past. But as I'll be dealing with ICA adapter cards on old machines, it's as important to keep IRQs in mind. And that goes as well for the I address, which should be system-wide unique and conflict-free. For the network card, 300 hex is a good bet for the moment. There was of course tools back in the days to help in finding conflict-free I addresses and IRQs, but let's look into that one in a follow-up. For now, I'll be just defining some hard-coded defaults in my autoexec.bat so I can work with environment variables. In order to not require fiddling around with autoexec bat too much, I'll check for an optional setnik.bat file during startup which allows for altered runtime configuration. As you see, it also included the packet in variable. That's for the packet drivers, of which multiples could exist, with an interface ID between 60 to 79 hex. I'll just go with 60 hex as the default. I build autoexec to bat to also call up autoload.bat which just includes the command line for the packet driver. And since I'm working with environment variables, I can simply pass the defined packet interface RQ and I address to it during startup. Autoload.bat is optional and if none exists you'll end up in this interactive shell where you could manually load the packet driver you need. Simply type exit to resume. Take this example, when I'm booting off my floppy disk in VirtualBox instead and how I'm bypassing my autoload.bat which would otherwise load an any 2000 packet driver. Instead, I'm manually bringing up the PCNet packet driver and continuing all along. I added as well some minimalistic checking whether the packet driver loaded or not, so you'll drop back to that interactive shell if for some reason no workable packet driver was found. Now, MTCP config will be created during startup, so MTCP tools know what configuration to use. This includes aforementioned packet interface identifier, but also the IP address and net mask. Speaking of those, my boot disk offers to run the HCP at startup. But since a DHCP server may not be available, I also offer the option to skip it. Now, I could build a logic for manually configuring an IP address and subnet, but I chose to implement the 169.254/16 network. That's the official IPv4 link local address space to use for auto configuration when no DHCP is present. At first, I had a rather static approach which would allow me to pick 9 IP addresses, but then I revised the batch file to select one out of 254 possible IP addresses randomly itself. Technically, the entire network block spans 65,536 IP addresses, but I decidedly restricted it to use a 24-bit network mask of 255.255.255.0, which gives me only 254 usable IP addresses. That's more than enough for my testing needs. Don't worry if you have no clue about TCP IP, I'll be covering up that later on as well. Now, as mentioned, I included some diagnostic tools from MTCP. I decidedly didn't include all MTCP utilities, so I don't need them at all for my testing needs right now. But as I'm publishing my build scripts and configuration to GitHub, it's up to you to extend it to include additional things. I try to be as conservative as possible and my makeboot batch file has some logic to distribute files across multiple disks. 
although I built that logic somewhat to match up with the space available on the smallest floppy I want to support, which is the 360k 5 one quarter inch disk. Make boot allows you to select the target drive and the disk format, but it can be easily extended to do whatever you like. When disk splitting occurs, especially for lower capacity disks, autoexec.bat needs to cope with that. So I built some checks into it to ask for disk swapping if a certain file or directory needed for the next step is not yet present. For me, that's crucial as I want to try bring my IBM PC onto the network and this one only has 360k floppy drives. Besides all that, if it all boots up, you get to see this simple menu, which allows you to either exit to the shell for any manual commands to carry out. Or you can fire up either MTCP's packet tool, which is capturing incoming network traffic, or the speed test utility, which will be listening for incoming test traffic. It will print to you the command line to use on the sending machine, so you can go into your throughput measuring right away. This is very much like modern day utilities like iPerf. Of course, I also include the ping utility, which sends an ICMP protocol echo request to any target machine on the IP network. But when trying to ping my neighbor machine, it wouldn't work, of course. That's because MTCP doesn't provide a memory resident TCP IP stack. And since that's missing, there's nothing there to respond to ingress packets. That's where Trumpet's DOS TCP comes in. This one runs as a terminate and stay resident program and will actually respond to ingress ICMP packets. That works as well when pinging the DOS VM from my Mac. Now, there's probably some room for improvement as I didn't really use it yet practically. But it should be good enough to help me with my next steps when building up a 10 base 2 Ethernet network in my next episode. Having said that, maybe I'll extend it for IPX and SPX in a second run. We'll see. What do you think about it? Let me know in the comments below. I'm the Vintage Collector and this was my story for today. Thanks for watching and see you again next Sunday.